So welcome everyone to the Great Writers, Great Readings Pandemic Edition. <laughs> um, I'm Kelly McMasters and I'm excited to host our first series of 2021. First, I wanted to say thank you for everyone here for choosing to spend your time with us tonight. I know there are so many amazing Zoom things happening all the time, but tonight too. So thank you for choosing us. Uh, and I apologize in advance for any technological awkwardness that may occur. As always, our guest writer will take center stage for most of the night, but I promise that you will have a chance to ask questions at the end. You can put them in the chat while we're talking, uh, and then you can also raise your hand once we enter the Q&A section and we will do our best to get to as many people as we possibly can. First, I wanted to say thank you, as always, to the Hofstra Cultural Center and the amazing Athleen Collins and her team. And thank you also to Professor Ethna Lay, I see her here from WSC, who led a fantastic discussion group for this book for our faculty last month. Thanks to our English department for continuing to support this series. And I also want to make a quick plug for our next two events. We've got Britt Bennett, the novelist Britt Bennett, joining us on March 10th, and Major Jackson, the poet, on April 7th. You may have heard of them. Um, and finally, a huge thank you to the director of Great Writers, Great Readings here at Hofstra, Martha McPhee, who is incredible at making my dreams come true when it comes to this series. <laughs> and that leads us to our guest this evening. One of my favorite working writers today, the inimitable Gia Tolentino. Yay, I see some, some clapping there. Uh, most of you know if you're here, you know why you're here, but I'll give a little, a little bio first. Gia Tolentino is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of the essay collection, Trick Mirror, <laughs> uh, Reflections on Self-Delusion. When we talked about who to bring to the series this semester, I thought about the writing that has meant the most to me in this past year. And while Tolentino's book came out pre-pandemic, um, her language, her relentlessness on the page, and her questioning have been a real beacon for me in these COVID times, offering a sharpness where most things feel muted and blurred. If you read about her, you'll see lots of folks comparing her to another nonfiction icon, Joan Didion. And if you read Trick Mirror or really any of her essays, you will quickly understand why. From youth culture to contemporary politics, Gia's intellectual gymnastics on the page leaves one breathless. Whether she is talking about reality TV, campus sex assault, the cult of weddings, or Thomas the Tank Engine, her <laughs> essays deliver force, curiosity, humor, and a kind of cutting hope. Please help me welcome Gia Tolentino. Yay. <laughs> I put it on gallery view and hid myself, which is how I prefer to do Zoom. And I can see, I can see some of your faces and I see my in-laws. <gasps> Hi, Lynn and John. <laughs> Although not quite in-laws, because as if you've read the book, you will know that I am not married, but <laughs> anyway. exactly. I'm honored to spend tonight with you guys. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I thought that I one way to do that intro because it was too nice and I can't, oh. I can't, <laughs> can't handle it. <laughs> no, no, this is, I'm so excited to have this conversation. Um, I was joking before, but also kind of serious before we let everybody in that I would like to talk to you for six hours about how you do what you do. Um, but I will try not to hug all the time from everyone. Uh, <laughs> but I did think we might start by um, asking you to simply read a few paragraphs from the introduction to give folks, anyone who might have not read uh, the book, to just give them a little overview of that, of that, what ever, how, what your work spans just in this particular collection. Cool. Um, I haven't looked at this in months. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote this book between the spring of 2017 and the fall of 2018, a period during which I, American identity, culture, technology, politics, and discourse seemed to coalesce into an unbearable supernova of perpetually escalating conflict, a stretch of time when daily experience seemed both like a stopped elevator and an endless state fair ride. 
when many of us regularly found ourselves thinking that things had gotten, that everything had gotten as bad as we could possibly imagine, after which, of course, things always got worse. Throughout this period, I found that I could hardly trust anything that I was thinking. A doubt that always hovers in the back of my mind intensified, that whatever conclusions I might reach about myself, my life, and my environment are just as likely to be wrong as they are to be right. The suspicion is hard for me to articulate closely, in part because I usually extinguish it by writing. When I feel confused about something, I write about it until I turn into the person who shows up on paper, a person who is plausibly trustworthy, intuitive, and clear. It's exactly this habit or compulsion that makes me suspect that I'm fooling myself. If I were, in fact, the calm person who shows up on paper, why would I always need to hammer out a narrative that gets me there? I've been telling myself that I wrote this book because I was confused after the election, because confusion sits at odds to my temperament, because writing is my only strategy for making this conflict go away. I'm convinced by the story, even as I can see it's photo negative. I wrote this book because I'm always confused, because I can never be sure of anything, and because I'm drawn to any mechanism that directs me away from that truth. Writing is either a way to shed my self-delusions or a way to develop them. A well-practiced, conclusive narrative is usually a dubious one, that a person is not into drama, or that America needs to be made great again, or that America is already great. These essays are about the spheres of public imagination that have shaped my understanding of myself, of this country, and of this era. One is about the internet. Another is about optimization and the rise of athleisure as late capitalist fetishware, and the endlessly the endlessly proliferating applications of the idea that women's bodies should increase their market performance over time. There's an essay about drugs and religion and the bridge that ecstasy forms between them, another about scamming as the definitive millennial ethos, another about the literary heroine's journey from brave girl to depressed teenager to bitter adult woman who's probably dead. One essay is about my stint as a teenage reality TV contestant. One is about sex and race and power at the University of Virginia, my alma mater, where a series of convincing stories have exacted enormous hidden costs. The final two are about the feminist obsession with difficult women and about the slow burning insanity that I acquired in my twenties while attending what felt like several thousand weddings per year. These are the prisms through which I've come to know myself. In this book, I tried to undo their acts of refraction. I wanted to see the way I would see in a mirror. It's possible I painted an elaborate mural instead, but that's fine. Is the next line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I just love that idea of the mural. Um, and, and so often in my classes, I teach nonfiction primarily. And so often we talk about what makes a topic story worthy. And I would love to hear how you find your topics because they span, you know, mm-hmm. Like I said, it's, it's, it just, it feels like everything. And then, but also when they line up and you're, the way that you attack them feels obviously very deliberate. Um, so how do you know when something is worth digging your teeth into? You know, I wonder if my answer to this is now changing. I mean, I've had an enormous amount of trouble with this in the pandemic, you know, to be perfectly honest, because I was always able, my metric for this was always really simple. It was like, if this is something that I would corner a friend at a party and talk to them about, you know, if this is something that I would make someone listen to me, figure something out over dinner, if it was something that would make your voice speed up, make you, you know, there's an idea that you felt some sort of chemistry with, whether it's a negative chemistry, whether it's frustration, whether it's attraction, in my case, it's usually the combination of those things. I think the things that I'm most interested in are things that I feel strong opposing sentiments towards. And I think that conflict is interesting. Um, But it was always just, you know, what would I make someone talk to me about in real life? And using that as my, and, and you know, I rely so much on real life to generate, to test these questions, you know, to see if they're actually interesting, to see if there's part of it that, you know, sometimes these, in like the, the Houston essay is about things that are, you know, Technically it's about Southern evangelicalism, but there are parts of that essay 
that tap into things that almost everybody has experienced. And the only way you can kind of figure out if a topic is sufficiently round and multifaceted, for me, it was like, I got to talk to people about it, you know, send up little trial balloons. And now in the pandemic, I can't do that at all. And I'm like, what is interesting? You know, the only things that I've found interesting, truly interesting outside of pop culture, outside of like, you know, some books and some movies. And it's just the question of the, dis you know, the, the, the non-existent American safety net. It's like, it's all I can think about, you know, it's the only thing I find interesting. And that's not great as a writer, you know? And so I, I need to find another metric for how I choose my topics if we're gonna be in this pandemic for much longer. <laughs> um, what do you say so, in your class? What do people, how do, you, how do you decide whether something is worthy to write about? I think similar to, um, I think this is why it's, I love teaching your work in my class because often uh, student writers arrive to the page and think they need to come with an answer. Oh, you should never come with an answer. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> yeah, exactly. never. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's an anxiety that they think they need to A, be giving the reader something yeah that's such the that's the like college admissions essay trap or something when people are like i need to come with this takeaway right the last two lines and it's like that to me is so counter i actually i mean one of the reasons this essay all of the essays in the book and i think in a lot of what i write there was a point of time point in time when i was writing for the website jezebel where i got so sick of the smugness the involuntary smugness that can come with like I just never feel sure, I never feel sure, even when I feel moral certainty about something, I never really feel sure that I've gotten it right. And I think most people should feel like that, you know, I just can't imagine. And certainly not when you're in college. I think um, one thing when I, in the brief periods of time when I've also taught something that, when, when someone comes to the idea of a piece with an answer, I often say like, try starting with that answer and seeing what the new question is, right? Mm -hmm. Because coming like writing to sort of prove the conclusion you've already thought about it, to me, whenever I try to do it, it's really flat. Like the writing is, there's none of the searching that you really want as a reader, I think, or as a reader in my case. Right, yeah, that friction. If, if it's sort of like music where if it's just the one note, it's not actually a song. <laughs> yeah, and in some cases, right, and it's like there are a few songs when someone has one chord and they're just, they're ruminating on it and it it can work in a few cases, right? I think that that's why the music case is so important. Like sometimes there's no hard and fast rule about anything, but yeah, what we look for is movement and we look for surprise, right? And we look for, it's so satisfying when something doesn't resolve, you know, in the way you expect it to or something. Right. And so do you know then before you start writing, what, is, what can you walk me through your process in terms of like what your first draft looks like? Or mm -hmm. I saw a friend on Instagram, um, an artist today, uh, Douglas Repetto, gave um, sort of a, a step-by-step. -step. He started with the final piece of artwork mm. and then started removing elements. Yes. And so he walked us backwards into the part where he thought he was going and then he went somewhere else. And oh, I thought, yeah. wouldn't it be amazing to see an essay in that way? Yeah. But how do you, at what point are you like, yes, this is worth a second or third draft? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it's different with every essay, but is there some kind of alchemy? It's different for every essay. I do, I would, I preload with a huge amount of research. Like I think I, I always do that. I. I read until I feel like I understand something, which often takes a really, really, really long time. And then from there, I kind of, it was, you know, these essays are m much longer than essays technically really should be. And they're, which is for a reason I'd been writing so much on the internet that I, I wanted like the kind of thing that would be kind of unbearable to read on your phone, that you would need like the sort of privacy of a book to be able to stand the length of them. Because I, I like writing like that, but all of these were different. Some of them, the optimization essay, the first section, I tried to get the tone, right. I don't know if I got it right, but I tried to get the tone satisfactory for, I would say like 75% of the time that it took me to write that essay. And I just rewrote and rewrote and rewrote that first page. And then finally it was like, you know, the, the steering wheel was on and then I just went very straight to the end. Cause all of these things also, I had been thinking about them for so long, like all of, 
so much of that essay was just me walking around very busy downtown New York and feeling like I was going insane. Like there were all these storefronts that would just make me shimmer with dread, you know, <laughs> like they were just about like move faster, be healthier, like, you know, work harder, all of this, all of this all at once. And I was like, isn't, isn't it also self-evident that the things that are inefficient are the only good things in life? And I was just going nuts. And so that was one. And then there were other essays like maybe the Houston essay that I wrote a really bad draft straight through and then, you know, just very gradually got, like made the entire draft better and better, you know, through like seven or eight or 10 drafts or whatever it was. And every time I start a new, like I'm kind of in the middle of trying to write a long thing for the first time, like I, for the first time in a while. And I'm like, huh, how does this work? Like every time I'm like, it's not gonna work. It's not, it's definitely not gonna work. But isn't that also- It's part think, of it, yeah. yeah. And that's what makes it so exciting. And, and Except we, sometimes it's not gonna work and you have to learn that. But yeah, it's, it's an adventure every time. <laughs> yeah, that's another good question too. How do you know when it's not? not? I mean, do you feel it on the page or does someone else have to tell you or? I think, you know, I always used to think, and again, this is another sense that's been really off during the pandemic. Whenever I was thinking about writing something, I had worked as an editor for a long time and I loved that work. And I would think, you know, would I assign this as an editor? You know, like, do I want to read this? Like, would I ask someone else to write about this? Am I interested in the topic itself enough? The second thing would be like, do I want to read this as a reader? Like, I would think about it as an editor and a reader. And then I would think, do I feel like I would have some sort of tangible pleasure or some sort of uniqueness in writing it? Like, could I bring anything myself? Or should, should this be... Or is this just something I want to read, you know? And if all those, if all three things were true, then I would write it. Um, but again, now, like, I don't know how you found this in the pandemic, but my metric for what I'm interested in is really off. You know, like I used to read absolutely everything that got published everywhere and I was interested in it no matter what. But there's something about like the lack of real world fluidity, the, the lack of real world contact with other people that's making, that's throwing all my sense, everything feels so important. And then everything feels so trivial at the same time, you know? And it's really hard for me as a reader and a writer to, and I've been getting in my head about it. I'm like, is this gonna last forever? But the, I compulsively speak to my friends about this. And I, I feel that many of us are having similar mm -hmm. kind of off feelings sometimes. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I love that that the way you just said that the privacy of a book yeah uh, and that there are different modes of writing so it sounds like you know you have the sort of essay brain and this is going to be an essay do you also do you keep a journal I know you you came from fiction to um, blogging to or I guess blogging then fiction then kind yeah. of blogging and um, so when a story approaches do you sort of say oh this is an essay, do, does it feel, do you have to work it out in the journal? Do you journal, do you not journal? Is it Instagram your journal? I don't know. I never kept a notebook. I mean, for so long I was writing at such a high volume that anything I thought was interesting would just come right out. You know, like there was, and that's kind of how I liked approaching writing. It was like a way to clear your head. I mean, a lot of the things in this book, they were things that I felt that I had some sort of issue with, like something I needed to work out. <laughs> they were complicated enough that I wanted unlimited space to do them, which is the appeal of a book. Um, I wanted to do them for myself. Like I wanted to not have any sort of specific audience in mind, um, which is something I'd never done before. I'd always kind of known where something was gonna run. Mm -hmm. And so with the book, I was like, you're gonna figure these things out just for yourself. And they were kind of, there were personal things that I wanted to put to bed in a little, like I wanted to get out all of my mental sort of hamster wheel <laughs> about them and then not really think about them again because I would have figured them out to the extent that I possibly could. And for the most part, that's what happened. You know, like I've never thought about weddings again after I closed, finished that essay. Cause it was like, I needed to get myself to that point and then it's, it's done. You know, I, I've, I'm now obsessing over something else. And so, it was always like that. And I only started keeping a journal again in the fall after I published the book, when I got super, 
I was sort of six months into this existential spiral about how much of my life I had oriented towards capitalist production. You know, it was like, I don't have, the, the way that all of the knowledge in my brain was being put to use and put to like a very specific financial use value started to freak me out. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, cause for the book for so long, it felt like I was just writing it for me. And then it came out and I was like, this is actually the most commodified thing I've ever done, you know, <laughs> cause it is the first thing that I've ever written that is explicitly for sale in a way that's tied to me. And it freaked me out even though it really shouldn't have. And I started keeping a notebook again and I, it has been really, really rewarding to just keep, it's mostly just notes about the weather and it's really nice. <laughs> but yeah, I haven't, um, usually when it comes to something that I'll actually maybe write about, it's like I email, I either email my editor or think about it silently for six months and then write about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder too, thinking about the that sort of boomerang after the privacy of writing when you're writing only for yourself and then it comes out, um, and maybe you didn't have an issue because so much of your writing was out already, but that mix of the personal and the really deep research. Um, we talk a lot of, in the classroom about vulnerability and the control of that vulnerability of what you need to put on the page to have someone hold your hand and, and come in and, and welcome them into the book or into the story with you yeah. for that universal aspect. But how did, I guess I was going to ask just how you measure mm -hmm. how, where you have that bar of what is too much, what what's safe. But I guess another question would also be, did that change after the book? That's a really interesting question. That's something that nobody's asked me. I, I think I do have, I never, and, and this is, I feel that it's a little bit poisonous, um, like me mentally, because I, I am, I think, an extremely self-conscious person in that like the mechanism of self-consciousness is kind of very central to what I write. But as a, in, in my temperament, I'm not self-conscious at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's been really important to me, right? Like as a, I try to write the way I live, which is openly, you know, and, and not, you know, I think I, not thinking about my presentation too much, right? It's like, I, I try to be honest and I, you know, in, in both things, I try to be a decent person and be open and whatever, but I would, you know, the question of like knowing how much to put in, knowing whether it's too much, it was always like whatever is necessary for the piece, you know, whatever. So there are some subjects where my introduction to the subject matter was personal and to hide that would to be to conceal something important, right? Like I, I subscribe to the, to the, to the idea that, you know, one of the ways to be most fair and transparent in writing is to show your bias, you know, to show your point of view and also to establish your authority. I mean, there are certain, um, and then there are a few essays like the scam essay and the heroines essay that were kind of really intense taxonomies. And then you end up putting yourself, I ended up putting myself in it so that people would keep reading, you know, so that there would be something to follow. Like otherwise those chapters would have been really dense. And in that case, it was purely just a craft thing. And, and I, I wonder if it's a crutch too, because people, you know, and I, I was newly aware of it after the book came out, especially with women, especially with, you know, younger women, it's like, there's always the question of like, do we like her? Do we think she's good? And people will continue to, people get interested enough in that question that they will follow you a long way. Mm -hmm. And after the book came out, I realized the extent to which that had been a part of it all without me really under, without me really knowing it. And I got a little self-conscious about that. And I think self-consciousness is really so corrosive to, you know, to, to living and writing well. And, and I have tried to really shake that off, you know, but the sense of being known and being investigated and being kind of looked at in that way, I was always able to just pretend that it wasn't happening. Like I wrote about in the reality TV essay, like I was always able to pretend that the surveillance wasn't there and that I wasn't doing it on purpose. It was just happening, you know? And um, the book made certain things about that really, you know, I, I had to think about, I had to think about them differently. And, but always it was just really like what, 
what does what does the essay need in order to establish the point of my interest, establish my personal authority, or to keep people interested in what otherwise might be dense. Like it was kind of important to me that this book be, I wanted to see if I could write a mainstream book, like kind of Trojan horse, some real density into something that would be extremely mainstream, I think. I was sort of, I was also, my, my other secret goal for the book was I wanted to write a book that was almost entirely about women that would be seen as a book about culture, you know? I was so sick of like books about women being like, it's pink and it's like the feminist book of women, you know? And I was like, I, I want it to just be about culture, but completely about women. Yeah. Yeah, in, uh, in my classroom, sometimes I call that uh, the spinach in the brownie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, which most of my students are there. They skipped that part where their parents tried to feed them vegetables through sweet things. But uh, it's it's definitely a thing. Um, yeah, the kind of. I think personal narrative in particular um, is really great to to push that out in front hook. Um, but I think it it's easy to fall short if if the research and the questions behind it don't back it up. Um, and and I mean, I, I was thinking John McPhee came to this series, uh, I, I think it was, a year, I don't know, COVID time, two years ago, a year and a half ago. And I, I think a lot about something he said and that really strikes me with your work in that the idea that curiosity um, and juxtaposition are the two key things mm. for a writer. Mm -hmm. And specifically for, um, I think he was talking about nonfiction, but I think your, the personal, um, even though these are in some ways personal essays, they're so deeply researched. And, and even within the research part and the personal part, there's this, the, your voice that just has this driving curiosity that pushes us through. And I think even without, it's not, I'm not reading, you know, to sort of peek under the covers in, in the ways that maybe some other, the writers that you're, that I think maybe you mean, you know, that are a little, um, I give to, to keep you coming along, right? I think here, the, the reason to move forward is that kind of, we feel that you are writing and questioning on the page and we feel it with you. Um, and I love that sense, that rush of, I, I don't know either. Can we look at this together? Um, and it's such a fun, right? Even whether it's, it's a really serious topic or whether it's something lighter, um, it's just a really fun place to be a, a reader um, and to be asked to, to jump along and see this part. I think that's actually, the secret part of this narrator feels like that we, the access that we get to access, that's exciting. Um, Thank you for saying that. I am going to take that to heart and, and try to remember that that's a good feeling. Yeah, I, um, I think, well, for me as a reader, that's what I love too. I mean, one of the things that I, and I think you can, there's so many, I taught a class, a, a short class at Columbia about voice and I taught, you know, people all across, you know, someone, their critics like Greg Tate writing for the Village Voice who are just explosive and kinetic and and musical and, and just so uh, like choppy. And then there are people like my colleague Vincent Cunningham at the New Yorker whose work is almost, it's almost like a sermon. It's so, so calm and so subtle and they're all over the spectrum. But the feeling that I really like as a reader is when you open a page and you feel like someone has placed you in, your, in a little hand and they're gonna carry you safely and set you down at the end, but you're gonna be carried really, really safely. And I think that is one, like I'm an impatient reader. And I think for writers too, I mean, that's the best thing we can do is try to meet our own bar as a reader to like, to, to really, what can keep us and you know as a writer what can keep you entertained mm -hmm. you know if you're spacing out when you're reading your own draft then you know it's dead right <laughs> like although you are also very tricky because um even though it does it does feel like you are bringing us along safely we never you never then solve it which yeah. I love. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things but yeah. <laughs> you never let us off the hook and um and that, that's something that I think is so unique in your work that you're not afraid to say 
I don't know either. Now I, now I have bigger questions. Well, I also think that, so this was the number one thing that people would ask me, you know, when I was on book tour, I was like, so what do we do? You know, like, like, where's the 10 step policy solution to, you know, and I was like, you know, of course, like it's, there's all of this stuff, but a, I feel like it's, you know, I, the, the, I feel like there, there must be, you have to really have sufficient disquiet to become politically committed to changing the things that really matter, right? Like it can't be, like, I don't like it when it wraps, like, it's like, of course we, we know the things that would fix or address much of the stuff I'm writing about, right? Like we know it's redistribution of wealth, we know it's universal healthcare, we know, but it's like a, every single person, anyone who's reading this, can get to that conclusion on their own. It's like, I will not condescend to the reader to say that the way to address, you know, the excess, the excesses of late capitalism or to do the things we all know we need to do, but you know, our legislators won't do. And it's also, and, and then at the granular level, the like, what should we do? What do we do now? It so clearly depends on each person's individual freedoms and desires and circumstances that it's like, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, you know, like we all, unmake and change the governing systems in our lives in whatever way we can. It's like, that's always the answer. We just do whatever we can. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> there's, I'm wondering actually to that note, the idea of sort of um, the way you make your narrator culpable and accountable in, in the same ways um, that you require of your reader. Uh, if you could read I think I, fl I flipped the order that I um, told you, but um, from the uh, generation in seven scams, mm -hmm. um, yes. I think I love, I, this is one of my favorite sections. Uh, and I think this would speak really well to, to what we just talked about. Um, so this starts, this is coming right after a section on lean in, like the lean in style feminism, which, you know, I will say about this section when I, I felt when I was writing this, and this is in 2017, I was like, this is not going to be in two years. This hopefully will appear very obviously true. So true that why would anyone ever write it? And that's kind of how I feel now. But I, and that's that's good, I think. So provided with a feminist praxis of individual advancement and satisfaction, two concepts that easily blur into self-promotion and self-indulgence, women happily bit. A politics built around getting and spending money is sexier than a politics built around politics. And so at a time of, unpre of unprecedented freedom and power for women, at a time when we were more poised than ever to understand our lives politically, we got, instead of expanded reproductive protections and equal pay and federally mandated family leave and subsidized childcare and a higher minimum wage, we got the sort of self-congratulatory self empowerment feminism that corporations can get behind. The kind that comes with merchandise, mugs that said male tears, t-shirts that said feminist as fuck. In 2017, Dior sold a we should all be feminist shirt for, for $710. We got conferences, endless conferences, the Forbes Women's Conference, the Tina Brown Women's Conference, the Cosmopolitan Fun Fearless Females Conference. We got Ariana Huffington's Thrive Global, which aims to end the stress and burnout epidemic through selling corporate webinars in a $65 velvet line charging station that helps you keep your smartphone away from your bed. We got the full-on Charlotte and Mickey Agrawal, who was regularly given media tongue baths on the subject of thinks, her line of period panties, until it was revealed that Agrawal, who proudly called herself a CEO, was abusive to employees and didn't know much or care about feminism at all. We got, instead of the structural supports and safety nets that would actually make women feel better on a systemic basis, a bottomless cornucopia of privatized non-solutions, face serums, infrared saunas, wellness gurus like Gwyneth Paltrow, who famously suggested putting stone eggs in one's vagina, or Amanda Chantal Bacon, whose company Moon Juice sells 1.5 ounce jars of brain dust for $38. On the wings of market-friendly feminism, the idea that personal advancement is a subversive form of political progress has been accepted as gospel. The trickiest thing about this idea is that it is, incomplete, is that it is incomplete and insufficient without being entirely wrong. The feminist scammer rarely sets out to scam anyone and would argue certainly that she doesn't belong in this category. She just wants to be successful, to gain the agency that men claim so easily, to have the sort of life she wants. She should be able to have that, shouldn't she? 
The problem is that a feminism that prioritizes the individual will always at its core be at odds with a feminism that prioritizes the collective. The problem is that it is so easy today for a woman to seize upon an ideology she believes in and then exploit it or deploy it in a way that, that actually runs counter to that ideology. That is in fact exactly what today's ecosystem of success encourages a woman to do. I know this because my own career has depended on to, has depended to some significant extent on feminism being monetizable. As a result, I live very close to the scam category, perhaps even inside it, attempting to say on the ethical side of there if there is one of a blurry line between woman who takes feminism seriously and woman selling her feminist personal brand. I've avoided the merchandise, the cutesy illustrated books about badass historical women, the, co the co-working spaces and corporate panels and empowerment conferences, but I am a part of that world and I, I benefit from it, even if I criticize its emptiness. I am complicit no matter what I do. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, there's no clear way to say that, to say, and and that's I think just one of the the beautiful things. It's hard to find a voice that is um, is saying I'm here, <laughs> and it's okay if you see yourself in me too. You know that. Yeah. Well, and there was also I mean for me it was like you know I really have there are certainly parts of this. You know I my first full time media job the only time in my career I've ever had health insurance was at Jezebel, which only existed because companies like Dove, which is full of shit, you know, would buy ads on Jezebel, right? It's like, I, you know, I've tried to be careful, you know, like I, you know, I, I think it, it was hard in the book and I don't know if I really succeeded, but it's the line between acknowledging the sort of inescapability of capitalism or you know any any of these systems versus the fact that we all do have varying but significant often amounts of agency to pull away from it right. and it was like i and it, it was hard to know which side to emphasize but i think you know I, I thought it was important to write from a standpoint of almost absolute complicity and to say what now right yeah definitely and and I think too, you you have this sort of superpower, uh, and where you just are able to see it. And I think seeing it sometimes, we don't need to know necessarily what to do about it. But if we learn and you teach us how to see it, um, I think that's the experience of after reading an essay. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. I don't walk away with the with what to do, but I walk away being able to see in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important. And in um, uh, I in class the other day, we were talking about sort of um, x-ray glasses, right? So if, you, if you're a narrator, right? And you're building your persona and you're thinking about your voice, the way that you can find your voice and what is important to you is to figure out um, those moments when you are going against the herd and you're sort of in a room and you're just sort of like, why is everybody going that way? I Don't they see what's right? And so I think it's those moments that we can use as writers to practice how to see as opposed mm -hmm. to push an agenda um, or come up with a solution. But it's more about if our, if we can teach our readers how to see anything, then maybe it's it's even just how to see. Yeah, the x-ray analogy is a really good one because it's like, you know, you can kind of intuit from looking at a body what what it might look like on the inside, but you don't know what the what the what the underlying structure is until you get that flash of a look. And once you get that flash of a look, like you know, you know what the underlying structure is. And and you like that that's an interesting that is I should hang on to that thought of the x-ray. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> well, I think too, right? If we, by leading us through and, and you're a narrator showing us how they are culpable, as a reader, we can no longer pretend that we are not. 
Yeah. And I also think the point of culpability, this is one of those holdovers, I think, for my, you know, for my ultra religious, like Southern Baptist upbringing, where it was like, it was so hammered into me. And I think politically, this is one of the ways in which my um, extremely, that background, it's, it can off, like, it seems diametrically opposed to where I've ended up now, you know, but when you, the church, it's like it was being hammered into you every second of every day that you, that you, you know, you are in a fallen state, you know, that you were in a fallen state and you have to work your way out of it. And, and, and it's okay. Like there's some beauty in that. There's some beauty in the effort of, of acknowledging that fallenness. And I think I, I, I rejected that idea in the kind of theological metaphysical sense, but it really became a driving one for me politically and existentially, right? That like, I, I find it very easy and natural to imagine myself in a perpetual state of fallenness that drives whatever actions you, you have to try to be better, you know, in, in whatever way matters to you. Like, I'm, I'm very comfortable in a point of being like, like I, I'm constantly like, I'm constantly doing wrong by being in this world even, and that's okay. And it, it doesn't have to be, par- like it can be the opposite of paralyzing. It can be really galvanizing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, that makes so much sense when you say that fallen comparison and- um, Yeah, I, like I, I hate it religiously, but I, I love it like in terms of, you know, committing to all this. And I, I think, you know, it's one of those things that um, I would, like sometimes when I talk, I don't know if you find this with your students, but like sometimes I will talk to people that are afraid of, or you know, anyone really who's like afraid of, oh, if we can't, if our, if our political standards are changing so quickly, like where, and I'm like, I want, I, I hope that in five years, I look back on what I was thinking and saying right now and, and have evolved from it. You know, like, I hope I look back on my language right now and think that was part of that was wrong. You know, I, I want to, I want to look at this later as, you know, insufficient, right? Mm-hmm. Right, that's how we grow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that also goes back to that x-ray goggle idea that your goggles in particular, um, or the x-ray vision, whatever we want to call them, uh, grew out of, you know, your parents are Filipino immigrants from Canada. You had this sort of hyper-Christian youth in Texas. Um, and, and that all informs your particular goggles, right? Um, and so I wondered if there, so you kind of answered my question in terms of what, what else really focuses your particular goggles in that, in that fallen analogy. I think that certainly goes for it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I thought, uh, I wanted to think, <sighs> Like if we could talk about opening up the x-ray vision into a body, if we could open up into your brain, when you think in essay, um, uh, there, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining this sort of uh, research heavy, you know, because your research goes from film to, you know, history, to books, to music, to people, um, to yourself. And, and I would, the idea that, this curiosity, it's, it's like the goggles are um, filtering <laughs> all of that. And it's almost, um, I can't imagine what, what gets cut, right? Because there's so much that makes it in um, yeah. that I wondered what, what even, what gets cut because it's, so, it's all so fascinating. Um, and, and I wondered going back to John McPhee, uh, that idea of juxtaposition and curiosity, uh, I wondered if, if we have, I think, just a few minutes uh, for one more, one more selection, if you could read from Always Be Optimizing, that, sure. that part. I think that would be a great one. Well, to- to, and to answer your question about what gets cut, yeah. you know, and this, it kind of relates to the goggles question. I think one of the things that, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses as brains and as people and as thinkers and like I have so many there are so many things that I can't do but one of the things that I have always that my upbringing kind of primed me for is that I feel very comfortable in a lot of different situations you know like I think I have 
I have tried to, and I like, that's why I like journalism. It's like, I like being dropped into a situation and seeing if I can fit in or disappear or, you know, learn the language quick enough to, you know, and I think um, I try to, you like, I, I try to maintain that ability. Um, like I, 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 I was like, well, you know, if you've lived in such a way that you, um, your, your interest in ecstasy extends to extensive recreational drug use, as well as like extensive time with, you know, mystic journals, like you have to put that all in there because it's, you know, you can't like, I, I, if you have it all be one or the other, then it, you know, it, it closes down like the, the actual nature of my interest was, which is often like with weddings, it's like, I wanted to I wanted to look at like 15th century legal contracts, but I also wanted to watch fucking Bride Wars, that horrible movie, you know, like, um, but stuff that gets cut, like, you know, I had, I read like 10 books on wildcat banking when I was writing the scam, you know, I like, there's just so much, I wrote like so many things about counterfeit money and like, you know, Mark Twain era historical scammers, like so many rabbit holes, the optimization essay, like so much stuff about, you know, like the history of foot binding and like lead paint and cosmetics. Like there's just, there's so much. And often I will go, you know, spend so much time reading something and then I condense it to a paragraph and I'm like, actually this paragraph is boring. And I just cut it and I'm like, well, whatever. At least I know a little bit about counterfeit currency when the state started issuing, you know, whatever. I like don't actually understand the, <laughs> the fiat system. Um, okay. Okay. So, the question of optimization dates back to antiquity, though it wasn't called optimization back then. In the Aeneid, Virgil describes what's come to be known as Dido's problem, in which the queen Dido strikes a bargain in founding the city of Carthage. She will be allowed as much land as she can enclose with a bull's hide. The question of what shape will allow you to maximize a given perimeter was answered by Xenodorus in the second century BC in the math of his era. The answer is a circle. In 1842, the Swiss mathematician Jacob Steiner established the modern answer to the isoparametric problem with a proof that I truly couldn't even begin to understand. In 1844, optimize was used as a verb for the first time, meaning to act like an optimist. In 1857, it was used for the first time the way we currently use it to make the most of. The next decade brought a wave of optimization to economics with a marginal revolution. Economists argue that human choice is based in calculating the, the marginal utility of our various options. A given, project, a given product's marginal utility is whatever increase in benefits we get from consuming or using it. To satisfy our wants to the utmost with the least effort, to procure the greatest amount of what is desirable at the expense of the least that is undesirable. In other words, to maximize pleasure is the problem of economics wrote William Stanley Jevons, Jevons, I forgot how to pronounce that, in the theory of political economy. We all want to get the most out of what we have. Today, the principle of optimization, the, the process of making something, as the dictionary puts it, as fully perfect, functional, or effective as possible, thrives in extremity. An entire industry has sprung up to give optimization a uniform, athleisure, the type of clothing you wear when you are either acting on or signaling your, your desire to have an optimized life. I define athleisure as exercise gear that you pay too much for, but defined more broadly, athleisure was a $97 billion category by 2016. Since its emergence around a decade ago, athleisure has gone through a few aesthetic iterations. At first, it was black leggings and colorful tank tops, spandex version of an early aughts going out uniform favored by women who might have, by the time of athleisure's rise, shifted their daily social interactions to yoga and coffee dates. More recently, athleisure has branched off and reconverged in permutations. There's sort of a cosmic hippie look, a sort of monochrome LA look, a minimalist and heathered outdoor voices aesthetic, and an influx of awful slogans like, I'll see you at the bar, bar like ballet bar. Brands include, include Lululemon, where a pair of edgy wonder under leggings slashed with mesh costs $98. Athleta, where a Pacifica contoured hoodie tank is $59. Sweaty Betty, where power, met look, power wet look mesh crop leggings, which are bum sculpting, you bet your ass, are $120. And the ghoulish brand Spiritual Gangster, 
where leggings with namaste across the ass are $88 and a cotton tank top screen printed with I'll see it when I believe it is $56. Men wear athleisure, uh, but the idea and the vast majority of the category belongs to women. It was built around the habits of stay-at-home moms, college students, fitness professionals, off-duty models, women who wear exercise clothing outside an exercise setting and who, like ballerinas, have heightened reasons to monitor the, mon the market value of their looks. This deep incentive is hidden by a bunch of more obvious ones. These clothes are easy to wear, machine washable, wrinkle proof. As with all optimization experiences and products, athleisure is reliably comfortable and supportive in a world that is not. In 2016, Maura Weigel wrote at Real Life Magazine, Lululemon's announced that for the wearer, life has become frictionless. She recalls putting on a, spare, a pair of Spanx shapewear for the first time. The word for how my casing made me feel was optimized. I love that we start at the Aeneid and end with Spanx. It's <laughs> just magical. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> this lesson was really spurred by my anger at uh, thanks like <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing um thank you thank you for reading that um i i i want to make sure that we um do have some time for questions so maybe while those start coming in um i have one oh and also i think you're going to need a COVID update for that athleisure section right uh <laughs> because it's the whole changed. honestly the optimization thing like i you know the same with weddings it's like i shit on these things so much in this book but what i wouldn't give to go to a wedding right now to go to 25 <laughs> weddings in the next 25 days and what i wouldn't do like early in the pandemic you know i shit so much on sweet green right the feeling of going in and getting a chopped salad in seven minutes and eating it in five while you look at your phone like i truly do think that's a horrible disgusting sort of you know awful sort of efficient feeling yeah but early in the pandemic you know i was making dinner i was like you know had spent an hour and 15 minutes just, you know, making sweet potatoes and kale, you know, there's like meticulously chopping. And I was like, what I wouldn't give to walk into one of these stupid fast casual restaurants and get all of this for $12 in, you know, like all of a sudden I was also like, uh, like late capitalism is also a miracle, you know, <laughs> like, like I, um, and obviously like I knew that while I was writing and my, and the pleasure I take in these things, I tried to be clear that I was drawn by desire and pleasure as well as, you know, incentive. But I, I sort of thought like, we all take that for granted, right? The pleasure that we get in these experiences, but not in the pandemic. Now I'm fucking dying to go to a bar class and have someone yell at me and like, you know, like make me work out. Like now I'm like, bring it all back. I'm tired. Just kidding. I, I don't actually want it all back, but I want a tiny bit of it back. <laughs> I want the option. Yeah, I want, or, you know, yeah. It's like, I want, I want, um, you know, in the in the dream world, I think one of the reasons these things feel so bad is that like, you know, the, at Sweet Green, like specifically one of the reasons I hate it is, is it like, it's like what I want in my, you know, in my socialist utopia is for all of the means of production for all of this to come about in a way that's fair, right? In a way that like, maybe like for there to be things that are efficient without paying people the least wage possible. It's like, that's kind of, we should be able to have the efficiency that our, our technological development allows for in a way that's humane. And there's so much writing about that kind of anti-capitalist, fully technologized future. I was just reading, um, inventing the future again to look up something and anyway. But anyway, what I wouldn't give to just go to dig in and get like <laughs> sweet potatoes. <laughs> 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 You know, speaking of books that you go back to or writers, um, uh, who is there so, anyone that we should be reading now? That's a really good question. I, I writers that I that I reread the most. I'm a big rereader. Like I reread for pleasure, so much. I did a lot of it in quarantine too. Um, um, like I'm already really excited for the getting to read Wolf Hall again. <laughs> you know, like I read that for the first time in quarantine. I was like. Oh, I can't wait for five years from now. I reread, weirdly, like fiction. I reread The Emperor's Children every summer. I reread Edward St. Aubin's Patrick Melrose series all the time just for pure pleasure. Um, in terms of nonfiction, I go back to Simone Weil all the time. Like, um, 
I, I didn't read Joan Didion for a really long time and I don't reread her often, mm -hmm. but sometimes for a reminder of like a certain kind of directness, I will go back to her or Susan Sontag or Ellen Willis specifically is one of the critics who's most important to me. Um, her, her essay, I think learning to see the light or something like that is, is one of my favorites. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think th those are those are big ones for me. Awesome. Kelly, there are a bunch of questions in the chat so, um, whenever you're ready for them. Yeah, I think we're ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want me to read them? That would be great. Yeah. This is from Damien. You mentioned that you often do a lot of research before embarking on a new essay. How do you think you arrive at a point where you feel comfortable writing on a given topic with the appropriate authority and or intimacy? Is doubt something that you have to overcome? Yes. And if I don't, I, I think that, um, so the way that I approach this specific question, this is a great question. I am a confident person naturally, like I, and so if I feel unequal to something, if I feel that I don't have the appropriate authority or intimacy, then I, I, I don't question it. You know, I am not subject to what has been known, like come to be known as imposter syndrome. Like I don't have it, you know? And so when I feel a significant amount of doubt, I usually just back away. I am butting up against that right now with something that I'm writing and I don't, and I, I genuinely feel it's the first time in a long time I don't know where the doubt comes from, if the doubt's legitimate, or if the doubt is related to pandemic and, you know, I just had a baby, so my brain is kind of like full of holes, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know whether the essay is bad or, you know, but normally if I don't feel the authority, I, I won't write about it. For example, like I've hardly really written about my time in the Peace Corps. I considered writing about it. Um, that's obviously a, an, that was a period of my life that was rife with self-delusion, you know, and, and it taught me a lot about the, the gap between intentions and, and reality and, you know, the, the primacy of systems. I mean, that period of time was extremely influential, but I don't feel that I know how to write about it. And I question my own authority as on that topic as a sort of mirror of the kind of imperialist, um, you know, like I'm gonna come in and fix things, you know, so I haven't written about it for that reason. Love to follow doubt personally. Here's Catherine from Manila. Thank you to Gia for being here and sharing her reflections as brilliantly written and compiled in her collection of essays, Trick Mirror. I enjoyed all the essays and the focus of women's selfhood journey and place and culture. I have a few questions about developments since the release of your book relating to your own new motherhood and then the rise of QAnon. Two separate questions. One, on mothers and daughters. You conclude, uh, sorry, you concluded your literary dense chapter, Pure Heroines, with a provocative quote uh, about literary heroines serving as mothers to daughters as an example, lesson, and point of entry to become something more. What did you mean in terms of selfhood and self-actualization for mothers and daughters as it came across at first read that mothers are stepping stone examples for daughters to consider how can I be more or better? It gave me pause as a mother of a nine-year-old and 12-year-old girl juggling my own continuing journey, navigating self-delusion and my own ever-changing selfhood while simultaneously and then it's skips. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And um, so specifically, so th the question is about, I'll, I'll find that last line. It's um, so that I, so the, that essay is about me sort of, about the sort of white default of the literary heroine, right? That the major literary heroines, we, it's, you know, this unending string of white girls, adolescents, women, and my tension that I felt towards that. And I ended up going like to the way that I untangled my feelings about that was reading a lot of Italian feminist theory from, you know, the seventies to the present, which is 
you know, an incredibly like fertile place to go back for rereading this Adriana Cavarero, especially. And there was a specific, there was a specific critical framework around the consideration of mothers and daughters that this feminist collective in Milan was using. And I, I wrote in that essay, I wish that I had learned to read these literary heroines the way the Milan women did with the same complicated, ambivalent, essential freedom that a daughter feels when she looks at her mother, understanding her as a figure that she simultaneously resists and depends on, a figure that she uses cruelly and lovingly and gratefully as the base from which to become something more. And the question was about like, do I only mean that mothers are merely like stepping stones for, for daughters to kind of transcend or be better than? And if my own experience just having had a daughter affects that. And I think, you know, it, I think, I think that is what the role of parents are to children, right? I mean, wh who has ever had a child and not thought I want more for them? I want more freedom from them for them than what I had. I want them to make more of themselves than what I made of myself. You know, I think that that, that, it's hard for me to consider any other way of looking at parents and children. With my child, certainly, I, I hope so much that she looks at me and is, and makes of herself something more, you know, that she does use me as a stepping stone. Um, Cause that's what it is to mother someone, right? It's to give, you know, it's to give of yourself and hope that they make something more of it. And it doesn't diminish, it doesn't diminish any single thing about the life of a parent, it's just, it seems that there's no other way to think about it. And, and the way in which that's okay, right? The way in which inequality is rendered productive when it comes to parents and children, right? The way in which you want someone to surpass you and you want them to learn you know, from the things you didn't get to do or weren't able to accomplish because we only are given one finite life and we make mistakes and fail to accomplish a lot of the things we want to. Um, I think, you know, my baby is basically like, you know, she's a, like, she's a bear cub right now. She's hardly conscious, but like, I, I hope very badly that she looks at me that way, you know, in all the ways that I meant it cruelly and lovingly and gratefully, you know, I want her to, I want her to, there's, there are already things that I compromises that I made in my life that I hope she never makes. There are a lot of questions coming in. So I'm going to try to get to the meatier ones that um, but we should definitely, send, there are lots of compliments, so you should see this change. Mm -hmm. um, we can print them out. How do, how, how do we construct a unique voice and let our identities and experiences inform our writing and understanding of the world when necessary without playing into shallow identity politics, asking as a person of color? Mm. Great question. Great, great, great question. Um, you know, the question of how to write write about identity without, while with while recognizing the enormous determinative force that identity still has in this world, right? While not like the whole point of identity politics, right, is to make identity no longer as determinative as it has been, right? The whole reason we we use this framework of talking about identity and identifying inequality based on identity is so that those things can go away. And so it's always tricky, right? You identify in identifying in identifying the, the structure that you wish to dissolve, you, you risk reifying it. And that's a, that's a legitimately tricky thing that I think you could spend a lifetime trying to get better at. But how do you, the, the specific answer to this question for me, it's been like what an early an early lesson for me in this. I wrote about the a University of Texas, the Abigail Fisher a, 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 um, affirmative action case. You, to me, it started with with looking at my authority, right? Like what what does your identity give you a unique and kind of final authority on? Like what are the things that you? What is the I feel like Audre Lorde has this like incredible quote. It's or it's someone else. It's like, what is the knowledge that you haven't said? And what is the, what are the things you wish you could forget about your life? You know, it's, or it's those things, the things you, you have to pay close attention 
to where your identity has truly, truly, truly been determinative. And you think about what about the world that gives you authority on, and you remember, and you remember those things. And you don't necessarily have to write about them. You don't have, you certainly don't have to only write about them, but it's worth remember, like that process of keying into exactly what your identity means as far as your vantage point, exploring that. And then, you know, in terms of how do we construct a unique voice? Um, you know, part of that is sort of like, I was talking about this with someone, like the, the sort of decolonization of language is something that I, you know, have a complicated relationship to. I think it's like the advice for this might just be writing for writing advice in general, where it's like write for yourself, you know, write for write for the deepest, least bullshitty, like most honest part in yourself and make your writing pass muster with that, not with any sort of authority or gatekeeper that you can imagine reading it, right? Like write to that really deep part in yourself that is not gonna like, that's gonna like see through any facade of does this sound right or whatever, like. It's really, I mean, this process is what I'm, what I'm talking about is really just pushing yourself to be honest. And this is something that I, you know, this is an ongoing thing for any writer with any subject, but about this question, it's particularly important and good luck and you'll, you'll be great. <laughs> there are a bunch of questions about Britney Spears to switch gears to a super hot topic right now. Um, what are your thoughts on Britney Spears? I have many thoughts on this, which perhaps you will read at a later date. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, so I'm scrolling through a lot still from Catherine. Uh, you, this is from Phoebe. Uh, your queef section, always be optimizing, took me out. What made you decide to include this in your <laughs> essay? You have um, a lot of wonderful, colorful language, sidebar. My new favorite description is secondhand vaginal exhalation. Okay, so this is an example of the kind of thing where like I truly like the point at which I, the point at which like the thing that got me to try bar, you know, this, this particular form of exercise that becomes this real fascination of mine and that is because this woman kept queefing next to me in yoga. Like that's literally why I tried this thing that I never would have tried otherwise, but this woman just couldn't stop queefing. And, and I felt this claustrophobia as if I was living in a snow globe filled with queefs. And I was just like, I have to fucking get out of here. I'm going to die. And, and that's the only reason that I got on Groupon and was like, tried this you know, extraordinarily expensive form of exercise that I would have never tried, you know? And so I included it just because it's like, you know, there's no point in hiding that. Like, I, I also, on a, on a real level, I think, you know, it can often be really trivial, ridiculous things that tip us into ideas that are important to us, right? Like it can be, and, and I think that's how life is. And it's, it's really, um, to preserve the ability to shift registers, you know, like to, to allow your full self, the one that is irritated by someone's, or not irritated even, just like terrified by some of like the, the volume of the queefing, um, but that can also follow that point to the point where it goes in the essay. Like it's, we are, we contain multitudes. There's no point in hiding it. Like I, that was one thing I liked about blogging is that you, I could be really serious when I wanted to be, and I could be absolutely unhinged you know, when the topic was silly and, you know, it's like, we, if, if it is within your personality to do both, but, you know, I want it to be within my writing as well. Um, do you, do you think uh, the mainstream feminism you described is a net positive for bringing feminist issues into the light or a net negative for diluting women's empowerment into something for profit? I think that it is, a net positive, absolutely. And I think that already, um, you know, and it's complicated, right? The question is always can, I, I already think that right now, even Sheryl Sandberg herself has doubled back on her own lean in philosophy, right? I mean, she had a horrific tragedy in her life and she realized that you can't tell people to lean in if they don't have money or if they don't have a spouse that is supporting them, right? Like you can't, she <laughs> came to the understanding of how our social structure determines our freedoms. like you know, she came to that realization. And I think we already, I've been saying for a long time, and I think that, you know, a lot of people, like the feminist movements that are important to me right now is the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the fight for 15, you know, like 
these it's it is these are organizations about organizing people from the bottom up and not improving people's you know not making sure that the top one percent of women can continue to be more successful and the more successful I've become in my life the more I feel like I mean anyone who was playing into the corporate empowerment thing it's I mean it's it's just it is a it's so pernicious and I don't know if they actually believe I don't know um but I think it is net positive because once you have held people to the ideology of feminism you know basically of equal opportunity then you've held them to it you've held them to sort of a stated commitment to this idea and I think we are all sort of collectively working in concert to bring that idea closer to what actual organizers, you know, and movement workers have been working at, you know, at the same time. Uh, being that you use literary techniques throughout your essays, why did you make the decision to do nonfiction as opposed to fiction? I went to grad school for writing fiction um, and I worked on a novel for five years and I spiked it because I thought it was bad. Um, but I actually just started writing fiction again. I, I, the first thing I did after, um, like the first work that I did after baby was born was I wrote a short story. And again, this is an example of my own moral compromise. Like um, the, like Amazon's publishing imprint, you know, they're, they're doing a, they were doing a collection on the theme of currency, you know, and they were like, would you write a short story for this? And, and I was like, sure. I have been wanting to write fiction again, you know, for a while. And it was a, you know, it was a topic that I gravitated towards naturally. So I wrote a short story for the first time in a while. Um, and yeah, I always say like, if, if, and if journalism, collapses like I will go to the woods and write another novel um but I'm not I'm not as good like I fiction is so much harder than like fiction is art and and journalism is work and I and I'm confident in myself as a worker but not as an artist at all you know there there are there are a few questions I'm trying to scroll through them fast since we're running out of time but they're coming fast I can, see if I can yeah. scroll but um but there's there are uh, quite a few about you know writing during the pandemic Mm -hmm. um, research, um, and how do you know when to stop? Um, here's one, what, what suggestion can you give us college students about research based on your experience? Yeah. Um, okay. um, do as much of it as you can possibly stand, honestly. Um, and go like research until you feel like you understand something like you, you'll, and the more you do it, the more you'll learn, like you'll learn the stopping point. You'll feel it. Like when you feel that you're done at a party, again, something that only comes with time. Like you have to go to a lot of parties to know the right time to leave. And it's the same with research. I also would suggest researching as, as widely in time and as widely across discipline as you can, right? Like you think about a question, ask yourself, when is the first time someone asked this question and just go to that, right? Like even the, as basic as like, you know, this can become a crutch if you do it too often, but look up the history of the word, you know, and, and you will often learn about different systems, different areas of the world, you know, uh, that are involved with your question. Um, and definitely, yeah, pursue the question, see if you can push it into other disciplines. Um, and college students, the reason I love research so much stems from being in college because you can research, it's hard to write when you're hungover, but it's very easy to reach when you're research when you're hungover. And so I love doing it in college because I could just lay in my bed and like, you know, like, so save it all for Sunday, for Sundays and just go to the library and force, you know, get a bunch of coffee and force yourself to read all day. And then, you know, you're not gonna do anything else that you're just gonna lay in bed and watch TV, just do your research, it's fine. <laughs> Um, here, you spoke about the theme of redemption um, in your writing and life. How do you navigate this theme in cancel culture? Is there a difference between virtue uh, signaling and self-deception? Trying to find this question. It's very, it's right at the end. It's the second to last one. Gotcha. Um, I, so I, Cancel culture is a term that is very frustrating to me because I think that people mean all sorts of things when they talk about it and it's and it's become a bit of like a, 
a bugbear like political correctness, you know, it's like, what are we actually talking about? And I think it's much easier to talk about cancel culture in each specific material instance, you know, like even with words like patriarchy, it's like things that get used a lot, they, they lose their meaning. And so I, I kind of find it impossible I do think that people can learn and change. And I also believe in accountability. And I think that those two things can exist. And I think that there's a lot of fear, you know, like accountability can look like, you know, severe punishment when in fact it's just accountability, but it differs, you know, based on case to case. And is there a difference between virtual virtue signaling, signaling and self-deception? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't even find those two things particularly, um, I mean, they're related, I guess, but yes, they're different. Um, wait, I want to, one of these questions is about, um, my favorite books of 2021, and I feel like I should shout out those. Um, I always feel like that's Patricia Lockwood's new novel, which just came out, nobody is talking about this, is absolutely incredible. This novel, Detransition Baby, is incredible. Um, my old professor, Peter Ho Davies, just wrote a book called um, A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself. Very short. Um, it's like one of the most interesting books written from a father's perspective about family and children. You know, it's, it's really, really good. Um, and the new Ishiguro novel, Clara and the Sun, for any, any of my Ishiguro fans out there, it's it's like, it's so manipulative and devastating. Um, I have loved those. I always feel like I, like shouting out books is, is the best. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, can I answer this other question actually? Sure. <laughs> Someone, th there's another one. How does one build your amount of confidence despite the negativity in this world? And this, I wanna, add, I wanna answer this in the, you know, there's a, appears to be a woman's name. And, and this is something that, like, especially talking to college students of color, this is, you know, or my, minoritized people in any way. As we know, you know, I mean, an important part of this is like, my, my confidence, a lot of it is temperamental, but a lot of it, you know, a lot of it is like, I can't, nothing I did shaped it in any way, like it was luck or whatever. But it's also like, no one is gonna, no one is gonna, no one is gonna feel con like you are the, where the confidence has to start from. Like the, the, the world is always gonna be like that. I think one of the reasons I feel confident is like, who else is gonna do this for me but me, you know? And that's how we have to be in life, right? Like um, no one, like it's, I think it's because of the negativity in the world that you have to build that confidence, right? Like it's, it's, um, it's it's actually you have to you have to feel the entitlement that a lot of people feel naturally is what people who were not given that in, that were not conferred that entitlement by social structures it is important it's important to try it on and to try it on privately you know I, this is why I sort of believe in writing for yourself right like try it on privately try writing for yourself as if you have all the right to to any thought in the world. And you don't have to show it to anybody. You just do it for yourself and see how it feels, you know? And just try it on. Like, I think the co like confidence in private and seeing what that leads to, it doesn't have to be in public. It doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to mean, um, you know, it, it, exerting your authority or space on anyone at, at first, right? Like, I think it is because the negativity in the world that we have to, believe in oneself and gas our friends up, you know, like it's um, like, I think like I, you know, that's like cheerlead your friends through whatever, you know, they're working through and, and they'll do, you know, they do it for you. And that's, that's all it is. There are more in there if you want to. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, but it's also 754. I know you have a baby. No, it's okay. I can go for, I can go till eight. Um, in our current moment, do you feel hope, despair, a combo thereof? Um, you know, absolutely a combo thereof. But one thing that I've been genuinely fighting is numbness, you know, and I don't know if anyone here can feel me on that, but um, I've, I've been very scared by that. Um, and part of it is that, you know, the only time I truly didn't feel like a, a personal life aside, you know, which has been very 
existentially fruitful for me in many ways because I birthed a baby. But like the only time I didn't feel numb, really didn't feel numb was at protests this summer, you know, like that was the only time. And I think part it's hard to process the world through a screen, you know, and, and we're at a time of just enormous death, enormous suffering. And we, you know, the, the one of the only crises that prevents extended physical connection to strangers, right? Like the thing that we, we most need, which is physical connection to other people, these networks of support, it is the thing that is physically potentially deadly. And there's something that comes from processing that contradiction that is making me often feel that I don't, that I can't feel th that my feelings about something are pointless. And that is kind of scary to me um, as, a, as, a, as an instinct. And so that is the thing that I've been fighting uh, more than despair. Uh, but I do, you know, I, I feel relieved that, you know, we are at least the country is now run by people who say they believe in the things that, you know, like, <laughs> like there is, um, like, I, I felt some little puzzle piece click into place, like not, not a miracle, not a new, not a new day, not a new America, but something clicked into place where like the possibility of rational conversation is, is, is back. And, and that's something, you know? <laughs> um, should I pick another couple ones? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. If, how did you know you loved writing? Um, because I did, you know, like as a kid, it was, you know, if you're, I still feel like it's, a, it's a wild thing to be able to do for work, the thing that I would do in my free time anyway. I mean, so I'm very aware that so few people in the world get to have their job be the thing that they would do. And I think that's one of the reasons that I try to lead and lean into the pleasure of it, right? Because ultimately it still is a massive privilege, you know, like I, um, if, and if I, cause I, I never assumed that it would be possible. I mean, maybe I will, end with this question from Joe, if you weren't a writer slash journalist doing what you're doing now, what do you think you'd be doing? Well, I always, I never thought I'd be a writer. Like I just didn't know anyone who was a writer growing up. I didn't think it'd be possible. Um, like I always kind of hoped and assumed I'd be a teacher. Cause I was like, I, you know, I loved my teachers and that seems like something that I could do. And I know people who do that. I kind of thought I would like I either thought I would write grants for a nonprofit, which I still feel like would be an amazing job, you know, one that I'd be very happy to do, um, or be a teacher, which is another job that would be too hard for me to do because I'm act teaching is actually incredibly hard. Um, and I and I think like, and I think um, this is something that like another question that I sometimes get asked is like, which writers do you look up to the most? And I look up to a lot of writers. And I look up to their work, but the to look up to writers in particular, I'm sort of like, we're why like the the work of writing is not inspiring to me. It's like it's just sitting down and doing nothing all day. It's like sitting in your chair. It's not. It's like the work that really inspires me are people who don't necessarily get cultural respect for their work, but still come to it with like love and confidence and energy like that. I think that's the way I try to think about writing, right? Like, um, like show up to it, like in, invest in it, something that has nothing to do with anything that's conferred on it in terms of possible, like in my writing, in terms of possible success, in terms of possible connection with readers, it's like to think of the work as inherently rewarding because it is, you know, a privilege in itself. I feel like that's like the that's like the main driving force in in what I do. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Really, I'm, repo I'm reposting uh, the link to bookshop for Gia's book in the chat. Um, so you can pick yourself up if you don't already have a copy, um, a fantastic copy there. And um, 
hopefully you folks will return for March 10th, Britt Bennett. Um, I'm really excited for that novel and for her to join. And such great questions. Gia, thank you so much for being so generous and gracious with your answers and your time and letting us pick your brain and do an anatomy scan and get inside there. Thank <laughs> you. Anatomy. Thank you so much for those questions. They were so, they were, they were so wonderful and so thoughtful. Oh, good. And Martha, thank you as always. Of course. Can I ask one more favor, Gia? Yeah. Um, uh, they, so, as people were asking for the list of books and it would, if you would type them I'll because type this, them. this will be them. available even if they, they've already left. Yes. So thank you so much. Yay.